Good afternoon and welcome to this week's edition of Halftime Talk. I'm delighted to be joined by His Excellency Fuad Senora, the former Prime Minister of Lebanon. Fuad, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, John, and good day for you and for all who are watching us. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to just kick off with a slight context, Your Excellency. I mean, it, we are coming out of the great COVID pandemic. Hopefully, many countries are still caught in its web. But inevitably, at this time, the, the Middle East finds itself in, still in a turmoil of with conflicts still plaguing Syria, Iraq, Yemen, most notably. And recently, of course, the terrible tragedies in Palestine with the Israeli government continuing to impose rather brutal uh, treatment of the Palestinians uh, in their efforts to find uh, some self-determination. So lots of challenges in the region. Uh, some bright spots we've seen recently, uh, Qatar uh, and the, the Gulf states find a, a rapprochement. And now we see the US and Iran uh, uh, in a talks in Vienna for the last month. So there's lots happening in our neighborhood, as there always is. But I'd yeah. like to position for you, uh, Your Excellency, what are some of the most notable challenges and indeed opportunities facing the Middle East as we emerge from the COVID pandemic? Yes. First of all, actually, the world is still witnessing the devastating consequences of the COVID-19. And definitely, this has great, great consequences, whether it is economic, political, social. And at the same time, uh, uh, this, uh, this concept was considered to be a major blow to, to the world at large. And uh, at the same time, what we are seeing of these consequences is nothing but the tip of the iceberg, in my opinion. Now, on top of this, there is now uh, about, about now 10 years have passed since the beginning of the what's called the Arab Spring, which uh, definitely has greatest uh, consequences uh, in, in undermining definitely the, the political, economic, and social conditions, and that long-term prosperity of a number of Arab countries. So we are still witnessing, because the situation in many of these Arab countries, particularly what we're talking about, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, and Yemen, and in, in, in North Africa, Libya, all these consequences are, we are still witnessing the, the, the results of uh, these, uh, these major events that has taken place. And this by itself has, has definitely played a role in distorting the strategic equilibrium of the Middle East. And uh, this was the result of a number of factors. First of all, the, the role that is being played by, by Israel through the, its continued military aggressions against the Palestinians, which we have with, witnessed the, the, last, the last episode of it uh, during the past few days. Uh, which was happening in, 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 in Jerusalem as well as uh, in, the West Bank, in, in the West Bank, together with what was really happening in Gaza with the major assault that was made by the Israelis. So this is on the one hand. On the other hand, as you know, the Middle East now is being influenced by not only by the role of Israel, but the, as well by the role that's being played by Iran with its aggression and its involvement and interference in the affairs of so many Arab countries, to the extent that so many politicians, Iranian politicians, they have been talking about their influence in four major Arab capitals, talking about Baghdad, Damascus, Beirut, and Sana'a. So this is, again, a very important factor, which has to be taken in consideration as long as the Iranians are keeping their major grip on these countries and using it as, as a way of improving their, uh, 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 let's say, uh, ability to, 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 to negotiate with the US as well as with the Europeans. 
And you've got the intervention that's taking place uh, by, by Turkey. Uh, although at, at the same time, I look with great hope in the role that can be played by the negotiations that's taking place between uh, Egypt and, and, and Turkey to the extent that may help in setting a better equilibrium in the, in the, in the region. And you've got four, which is the role that's being played by, by Russia in Syria, uh, which is definitely has major consequences, particularly that Russia is, uh, is helping in maintaining Assad uh, for a third term uh, in, 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 in Russia without realizing that this doesn't help. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, definitely the role that should be played by Russia in order to, to, to enforce the unity of Syria and the return of the Syrians to Syria and, and the reconstruction of Syria. So all these matters are still unknown. So all if, this- If, if we, if we that take- these, Yeah, just one, one minute. Yep. These factors are so important, but the important thing which is still missing, what is the role of the Arab world or the Arab countries? And you can see that each of these Arab countries and the surrounding countries are each one of, uh, let's say, busy and involved in many of the issues within these countries so that they are not able to play the important role. They are not well united. They are not standing up to be counted. This is what I want to say. And, and as, as, you, as I can really say more in this, is that there is no such a thing called good winds if you don't have the right masts, in the sense that something has to be done in the Arab world to stand up to this challenge, major challenge that is facing them, because each one alone cannot face the intervention and the role that's being played by these four major let's say, parties together with the other parties that are really uh, working behind the scene, whether the US or the Europeans or whatever it is. It is right. something that has to be done by the Arab world to present their case and try to defend it. If we look at that point uh, that, that you finished with there and started with, which is the Arab Spring 10 years yeah. on. Yes. Just to clarify on that point, is the Ar did the Arab Spring ever deliver? Is it over? Is it dead? How does you, do you quantify it in 2021? Uh, uh, and what are its legacies? Well, actually, the Arab Spring, what really started it, is that this accumulation of anger and inability to communicate with the various regimes in these countries. But the problem that it, it was, what was supposed to be, to be a real spring in the Arab world turned out to become a stormy winter time. And uh, it ended up with, with, with the, uh, let's say, uh, the uh, reducing role or to the elimination of the role of the national states in these countries. And the, uh, the, let's say, the beginning of major, major uh, uh, non-state non actors in these countries, what I mean by the militias that are taking place in, in, in Libya, the, the role of the, let's say, the various powers that are being fed by Iran and uh, they are uh, acting on behalf of Iran, whether it's Hezbollah in Lebanon or Hajj al-Shaabi, in, in, in Iraq, and uh, as well as certain militias in Syria, as well as the Houthis in Yemen. And those all are acting on behalf of Iran and being used by Iran on the basis of certain causes that are actually helping to improve the negotiating power and negotiating stance of Iran with, with the United States. Well, this let's, is take happening that, let's, quite... let's take that point and, and say, will it, will it succeed? Are we at a, an inflection point with the Iran relationship with the region? We've heard recently that the Saudis and the Iranians have sat down together in bilateral talks in Iraq. Of course, we're one month into the US 
and the Iranian talks in uh, nuclear talks in Vienna with all of the P5 uh, of the Security Council. Is this a moment do you think that will lead to a breakthrough? Well, let me start by saying that we have to understand as Arabs and as Iranians that both of us are a fact of geography and that we have to live together and cooperate together. No matter how long would it take, we ultimately have to deal together. So we better do it now rather than delaying it for more years in which we fight more, we distract more, and we exhaust all our possibilities and, and uh, economic, uh, economic resources. That was, has been going on now for over 30 years. For over 30 years, that was, has been going on. So it's very important to sit down and, and we reflect on the matter. What is happening, it is, is not conducive up till now for such, let's say, a movement towards, towards real peace in the region. Uh, each one, whether the, and on the Arab side or the Iranian side, has to realize that we have to accept the other party and to accept living together and dealing together as well as cooperating in, on, on economically and to have to understand that fatigue has reached high levels both in both sides and at the same time that we have to accept to have a mutual respect for each other and to accept non-interventionist policies between each other, i.e. Iran has to understand that it has to scrap its policy of what you call it exporting the revolution on the basis well, the, of the, their the negotiations in, in Vienna are though dealing directly with the nuclear talks as they no. were five years ago. But even though they don't involve all of these extraneous issues, if indeed the U.S. does a deal with Iran, do you expect progress on all of these other issues? Well, you see, better to be done. But up till now is that we are repeating the scenario that took place uh, five or six years ago, is that the United States is, re is really keen on striking, an, uh, let's say, an agreement with Iran to... Uh, take care of the nuclear issue only. But there are two other major issues. There is the issue of the ballistic missiles of Iran, and on the other hand, the, the, the issue of the intervention of, of Iran and the involvement of Iran through its various tentacles and arms uh, uh, with, with so many, so many countries in the, in the region, which is contributing towards the instability of the region. And as long as this, this situation continues, news continues as such, then I think there is, no, there is no way of moving ahead towards striking a permanent and viable peace. Now, Do you think there will this, be a deal though, just to, because I'd like to get on to some of the other topics that yeah. do you think the US and Iran and the P5 will do a, a deal in the coming weeks? to put this uh, nuclear agreement back in place? And, and I think, first of all, that both of both parties are, are not keen to, to really arrive at a deal now before the elections in Iran. So this is something that we have to hold in mind. I thought the they were going to race to get one done before then, but... No. The second thing, I believe that you have to realize what, what, what do they call it? The theory of the connected vessels. All issues are practically connected with each other. And in this regard, I believe that something has to be done regarding the, the Palestinian issue, which has surfaced back again in the region, particularly after uh, what really was proposed by the United States uh, over the past, uh, let's say, uh, two years, regarding the, the, the Abraham Accord, or what is called, called as such, which is a misnomer by itself, because the, 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 the conflict between the Arabs and the Israelis is not a religious conflict. It is a conflict between, let's say, the Arabs and the Israelis because of the interventionist and the, 
and the colonialists uh, and and they are what they are trying to to, evac to evacuate and evict the Arabs from from Palestine, which they are still continuing this process well, they, as they have been, been doing, doing for, for in Jarrah in, in Jerusalem. On that point, we've saw the terrible events of the last few weeks in Gaza in particular, but clearly, as you mentioned, Sheikh Jarrah, which is coming up for decision in the Israeli courts yep. in the coming days. Uh, but of this whole month and everything that is, has, has happened, what is your assessment of the Biden administration's performance as the kind of arbiter of, of, of uh, honest broker and, and, and so forth? Uh, has the Biden administration shown its position, do you think, vis-a-vis -vis Israel, Palestine, and so the region? How do you assess their performance in the region? Well, let, me, let me start by, by quoting an anecdote. Uh, that once said by Churchill that the U.S. always do the right thing after trying everything else. And what we have been seeing uh, is that these, they, 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 what you call it, trial and error that they are committing is at the expense of the United States, but much, much, much more at the expense of the, the concerned countries which we are suffering. And we have seen this that the United States, when they engage, they do it wrongly. And the one they want to withdraw, they do it at the same time wrongly. This is the thing that we have seen previously in Vietnam, then we have seen in Afghanistan, and we have seen in Iraq and in Syria. And now we are seeing actually in, 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 in uh, let's say in their role in, in, in Palestine, which they are still not having a real clear policy. They want to help Israel defending itself, and they talk about, have, let's say, viable state as, as the new administration. Because in the previous administration, what has been going on is that, that there is nothing called a, an, a Palestinian cause. And what uh, Netanyahu has been doing in his latest offensive is that he thought that this will be the end of the Palestinian cause. What happened and what was the result is something to the contrary. What really emerged, it was that the Palestinian cause is still alive, still alive in the conscience of all the Palestinians, not the Palestinians of the West Bank and Jerusalem, and not the Palestinians that are in the diaspora, but as well in the Palestinians of 1948. Those Palestinians who still, who has no, they don't have any other nationality other than the Israeli nationality. And they really expressed their views that there is still a problem. 20% of the started, population of Israel is Arab Palestinian. Yes. You see, I, I, I started to start thinking that something has to be done even by the friends of Israel. They have to really see clearly with great vision towards the future how to save Israel from the pitfalls of its wrong policies, the policies of the extreme right that is converting Israel effectively into an apartheid state. This is something that has to be looked and it when has, you they the, have to, yes. When you mentioned the, 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 the Israeli Palestinians uh, of 1948, uh, one thinks of the idea that the what that the possible outcome is the inevitable one state solution that the two state solution is is technically dead i mean it's it, it's an unworkable equation it's a legacy from another time it, it appears to me i welcome your thoughts on whether you would agree with that is the one state solution even viable you see it is a real dilemma for all and particularly for the Israelis. The, all the theoreticians, the Israeli theoreticians, when they thought they want to establish a state of Israel, that they wanted to establish a state for all and not, and not for, for uh, the Jews, huh? which is converting now that they wanted the Jewishness of the state. And this is what they are really working on towards evicting the Palestinians out of. This is not going to work. You've got, you've got several million people and you have to deal with, you cannot really evict all these 
people or kill them or slaughter them. This is something that it would, would have to be looked at now with great they have, care. They have had successful clearances in the past. 67 uh, was notably. But, but the demo, demo, demographic factors is always, uh, let's say, they have a race with the demographic factor, which is after the, uh, is putting them always late in trying to really deal with, deal with it. And I believe that the two options have to be put on the table whether it is one state, which effectively I'll be, I would, I would consider it to be, uh, let's say, providing the feeling of belonging to the Palestinians to a, to a state and the feeling of peace and security for the Israelis. Otherwise, the other option has to stand, which, which is the other option that is supposed to be really responding to the Arab Peace Initiative of 202, or as well, for the, let's say, all the international resolutions that call for the establishment of a state of, of Palestine. I mean, it strikes me just to close on this subject that President Biden didn't really want to get involved in the Middle East, in, in Palestine, uh, except to resolve the Iran question, or at least to bring back the Iran nuclear agreement. He didn't want to get his administration sucked into some of the challenges of the region. But inevitably, it appears that you can't choose what's going to happen. Uh, does America have to be returned to its, you know, Jimmy Carter era sort of honest broker role? Is that even viable? Well, I mean, uh, yeah, this is this is the problem that we have facing in the Arab world with the role that was always played by the United States, which is a one-eyed policy, and they are seeing only the interest of Israel and not seeing the interest of the other party. And this is, this is the thing that really has been lacking over the years. It is high time for the Biden administration uh, that uh, uh, to, to, to draw the right conclusions of what really happened in the last few days. And again, in trying to really set, a, let's say the grounds for a better future in the region. The, as when I, when I really uh, uh, use the term connected vessels, because as you know, the Iranians have been using this as, as uh, let's say, a, 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 a reason for their intervention in the, re in the region, as well as trying to, uh, let's say, use this as a way of improving their negotiating stance with the United States. It is high time to really start looking out of the box for the Americans and for the Europeans, because uh, uh, you see, you see, uh, nature has taught us great lessons. We always used to, 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 to use the term of the bird's flu that, that uh, travels without getting a visa from anybody. Now we have the COVID-19, which has taught us another lesson that it travels huh? and it communicates this disease to, to everybody. It's very important to try to set the grounds for a better future in the region. I'm not speaking utopia. I'm speaking in the terms of interest of all, whether it is in the, in the Arab world or as well in Iran or in, in Europe and the United States. This is a problem that is affecting all the world and creating more, let's say, tension and extremism. And at the same time, nationalistic, uh, let's say, views that are very extremists. It is high time to, to really look at the matter from a different angle in order to find real solutions. People another, look for real solutions and another, not for quick fixes. Another uh, big issue in the region that seems to be attempting to find a solution is between Turkey and, uh, and Egypt and, and, and Egypt, Egypt's yes. allies. We've seen for the last eight years, Turkey and uh, Egypt and, and Saudi Arabia seem to have found themselves uh, in a very difficult relationship uh, since the fall of the uh, Muslim Brotherhood government in Egypt. Uh, that's eight, whatever number of years ago, part of the Arab Spring. 
what is your assessment of the recent talks in Egypt between the Turks and the Egyptians? What's your outlook for the relationship uh, if it fails or if it succeeds? You know, I, I have my point of view in this regard, which is uh, the relations between the Arab world and Turkey. Again, has to go back to accepting the facts of geography. Turkey and, uh, and the Arab world are adjacent. There are lots of, of commonalities among, let's say, the countries, basically water, as you know, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and being close, actually, close neighbors. And uh, uh, yani, uh, we have learned- And the Ottomans that, ruled the region for 400 years. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, uh, you see, I recall there is a nice, a nice uh, proverb in Arabic language. It says that if your neighbor started shaving, his beard, you start to have to wet your beard yourself. Huh? Uh, you have to prepare yourself for that. Why? Why am I saying this? I'm saying this because. Can you say it in I, Arabic? Yes, is a hal jarak bil danak, which means you have to, to to wet your beard in order to prepare yourself to to, sh to shave it. You see, this is something we have. We have common interests, and. The, 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 the thing that has been going on for the past few, few years in terms of supporting the, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood by the Turks, this is, doesn't help, actually creates more tension and more conflict that, that will produce nothing except more destruction and more waste of uh, 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 possibilities and, and, uh, uh, and uh, prospects in the region. That's why I, I believe that uh, the, the, the beginning of these negotiations between Egypt and Turkey is, is quite very important. That sets the ground for, uh, for good relations between the Arab world on the one hand and Turkey, and that will help in, let's say, stopping the distortion that's taking place for the the imbalances and the lack of equilibrium in the region. Uh, you've, got, you've got, let's say, three, three countries that are playing around and messing around in the region and varying degrees, for sure. You've got the Israelis who are, who are still considered the enemy, and we have a very serious conflict with the Iranians, and we have several conflicts with the, with the, with the Turks. It's very important to start unblocking this, this, this situation and try to really find something in common between Turkey and the, and the Arab world. And it is in the interest of both, but it has to be set on the right grounds, right grounds of non-intervention in the domestic affairs of each country and on the basis of mutual respect. And it is in the help, in the, in the hope of producing real economic benefits to all. There, there is something that can be done that ultimately can help every every country in the region. Uh, I mean, between let's say Arab, the Arab world and Turkey, and the Arab world and and Iran. As far as Israel, we have discussed what what can be yeah. done. Yeah. If if we look at the, all of these big actors, uh, Israel, uh, the Iranians, and and the Turks, or the three sort of major non-Arab actors in the in the Middle East, the other one that has come uh, quite uh, significantly back into focus is the Russians. Yes, uh, we saw uh, five years ago uh, the. Uh, OPEC and, and non-OPEC countries come together in an alliance, which includes obviously principally Russia. Yes. And ever since, it seems Russia has become much more engaged back into the Middle East. Like when I was a child growing up in Egypt, they were very present and they went away for a few decades. And now they seem to be back and in some ways the biggest player. How do you see Russia's re-engagement in the region? Uh, positive, negative? neutral and it's well, out for, for sure that they have really acted intelligently and they are getting involved in syria and having a real effective role in syria uh, but this role as it appears now it is uh, really in as if it is intended only to keep assad uh, for a third term as a president 
And uh, this, in fact, uh, is not the right solution for, for Syria uh, because uh, it doesn't really solve the problem of the Syrians. You've got 50% of the Syrian population. They are, uh, let's say, uh, 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 removed out of their towns and villages and cities, either within Syria and at least a quarter of, uh, let's say, half of this people that were displaced, they are displaced outside Syria. So uh, 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 Russia, in its role, they have to look with great vision and to be ready to assume the role of this involvement. Because if it is only to get asset in, this doesn't help at all. Because at the end of the day, how to get back the Syrians within, within the, to, to Syria, how to safeguard the unity of the Syrian people and the unity of the, uh, of the, of the country and the sovereignty and the independence of Syria. Uh, otherwise, they are getting into what you call it a quagmire if it is not really going to solve. So uh, 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 Russia, with this involvement, it has to be ready to assume the role and the, and, and the consequences of assuming this role. Uh, so it is very important that, I mean, not to have great expectations that cannot be met. We know the, the limitations and the abilities of the Russians. Definitely, they cannot really come up with a solution to Russia, to Syria, if it is not within, uh, let's say, accepted by the Americans and the West. And they cannot really solve the problem of, of Palestine without getting the, 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 let's say, the consent of the Americans. But it is very important to play, to play, uh, let's say, a role that is conducive towards finding a solution. Otherwise, they, have, they do have a unique opportunity or position in a way that America doesn't have, that, in that Russia is friendly with Israel, Iran and Turkey. It, has, it sits down, Putin sits down and has very warm conversations with all of the leaders, Netanyahu, the Iranians. Yeah. Uh, can they play a brokering role in this great solution for the region that the Americans have simply failed at over many decades? Well, let me tell you, over the past years, let's say America was on the leading, leading position and uh, Russia was actually a blocking, let's say, factor. Now you've got, you've got uh, Russia is in Syria. They are in the, in the driving seat, but the uh, uh, United States actually is in the blocking, let's say, blocking seat. So this is something, this is what I, this is why I said the, the limitations of the role. We look forward for a constructive role that can be played by Russia. And it has to be now as, because they are there, they, are, they have to. And, and without really, let's say, uh, 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 without uh, an, an, an underestimating the role that can be played by the Arab world and what we are seeing as possibilities that is really might, might take place between, let's say, Egypt and Saudi Arabia in developing a role so that the, the let's say, the interests of the Arabs in Syria and Iraq can be respected and heard. Otherwise, if you are not there, if you are not, if you don't stand up, nobody is going to really take care of you or take or even to listen to you. So it is very important. On the one hand, Russia has to really be proactive in trying to propose some solutions to the problems that we are seeing in Syria and 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 ultimately in in, in Palestine and and Israel, and at the same time. It is the duty and the responsibility of the Arab world to stand up, let's say, with a clear stance as, as, as we have previously uh, formulated when the Arabs proposed the, the Arab Peace Initiative. Something has to be done now in order to uh, really carry the region towards, a, 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 let's say, a sustainable situation. This situation is definitely unsustainable and will carry with it lots of conflicts and disasters for all. Well, not to end on, 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 on such a negative note in essence, but ultimately the realities are what they are. Uh, a time 
a moment in time to review the, the Middle East. Uh, Your Excellency Fouad Senora, former Prime Minister of Lebanon, thank you so much for being on this week's Halftime. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Thank you very much. Thank you.